Neck Anatomy. We will be talking today about surface anatomy. I always like to have at least one quote. Why do we study head and neck anatomy? You need to realize with head and neck anatomy, this is a building block for the next four semesters of school in addition for your entire career. Truly, you need to be able to provide a patient examination in order to provide an intraoral, which is inside the mouth, and an extraoral exam, which is outside of the mouth. You need to know what's normal versus what's a deviation. Also, when you know your anatomy of the head and neck, you'll know when you're taking radiographs or x-rays, again, what is normal and what is not. You can understand the features of the temporomandibular joint. People will say they have TMJ. Well, yes, you do. It's the temporomandibular joint. But they may have temporomandibular joint dysfunction, which is when there's pain associated, clicking. There's a lot of different issues with that, which we will talk about. Also want to be able to understand the spread of infection. And the nice thing is in your fourth semester, you're going to learn how to administer local anesthesia. So you need to know where are those nerves? Where are those veins and arteries? Again, when you do an extra oral examination outside of the mouth, you want to be able to take a look at the patients and look for symmetry. If you notice the patient over here, Sorry, anytime I move my cursor, sometimes it changes, excuse me. Notice the swelling on the, the side of the face. And once you look in the mouth, you see that there's an infection. Also, patient with acne, it can cause your, your lymph nodes to enlarge. So you need to know what, what's normal, what's not normal, what's going to cause you to postpone treatment or modify your treatment. Intraorally, you can see on the upper, there's the palatine tonsils. Those are commonly infected. You need to take a look at that to see, again, do you need to postpone your treatment? You see the tongue and those large bumps. You need to know, is that normal anatomy or is that an abnormality? That's actually your circumvallate papilla. Also, there's the frenum with the little tissue tag. Again, nothing to cause you to change your treatment. Okay, we will be talking about anatomic position throughout your career. So your anatomic position is basically when you're standing upright, arms at sides, palms, feet, and head forward. Supine position is basically what you put your patient in when you're, when you're providing dental care. Prone position is when they're lying on the front, lying on the belly. Planes. These are important to know, especially when we do things like dental radiology. You need to know sagittal plane is a longitudinal, breaks, breaks the body into two, right and left side. Mid-sagittal, think of mid, the middle. Equal parts, right and left, the median. Coronal would be frontal. Transverse is kind of Cutting in half, look at that middle picture. Again, when we look at it, when we talk about the sagittal section, when we're taking radiographs, we're going to want to make sure that the mid-sagittal plane is perpendicular to the floor. So that basically means that the person is sitting straight up, the head is not tilted to the right or the left, it's straight. Other terms we're going to be using all the time are things like superior and inferior. Think of the head is superior to the feet. The feet are inferior to the head. So when we're talking about superior, a superior nerve, you know the superior would be upper. So it's going to be in the maxilla. Anterior, posterior. Posterior is the back anterior front. Just like your anterior teeth are your front teeth, posterior teeth are your back teeth. 
ventral and dorsal. The ventral of your tongue is when you lift your tongue up and see the underside, the belly part. That's your ventral of your tongue. Dorsal, think of, the, of a dorsal fin, is the posterior of the back. When you stick your tongue out, you're looking right at the dorsal of your tongue. Again, this is just giving you some other examples of what's superior, anterior, medial. Medial, think of midline, lateral on the outside. Proximal and distal. Distal is in the distance. Proximal is closer to the midline. Medial, mid, lateral, outside. Superficial, think of somebody who's superficial, just on the surface versus deep. Regions of the head. Now these regions of the head really coincide with the names of bones, which we will be getting into. So the frontal region is your forehead. Parietal and occipital, it's the sides of your head. Temporal, think of where your, where your temple is. Orbital is your eye. When you think of supraorbital, you think of the top part. Infraorbital would be below. Nasal, think of your nose. Zygomatic is your cheek, your cheekbone. Buccal, that's going to be an important area for us. Buccal region is basically your cheek. You'll find that your buccinator muscle is there. And then the mental region. The mental region is your chin. I always think about when somebody's thinking, they put their fingers on their chin, like, hmm, mental. So when we think of the frontal eminence, that's the prominence of the forehead. The glabella, that's the area where sometimes people have Botox. That's the flat area between the eyebrows. Supraorbital ridge, again, would be the above, the prominent elevations over your eye orbit. Think of where your eyebrows are. Versus infraorbital, which would be below the eye. Again, you need to know landmarks of the temporal region. When you think about your ear, you need to know about the external acoustic meatus, which is the opening to the air canal. And then there's a little flap of cartilage right in front of that opening called the tragus. This is an important landmark when we're taking radiographs because we'll say you want your allotragus line to be parallel to the floor. I just like this slide. Okay, again, here's the allotragus line. Alla are the wings of your nose. Tragus, I'm going to try to use my pointer here, right here. Okay, so you want to have that parallel to the floor. Okay, when we think about the orbital region, think of orbit, think of circular. This is your eye. This is the socket. So you should know the different areas of the eye. The iris is obviously the color of your eye. Pupil, the opening in the center of the iris. An important landmark, again, is the medial and lateral canthus, the inner and outer corners of the eye. Again, when you're taking radiographs, you may need use the landmark when you're taking your premolar shot, you may use the outer or the lateral canthus of the eye as a landmark. So again, you need to remember these. The lacrimal gland, we'll be talking about the lacrimal gland when we talk about glandular tissue, but this is what produces tears. Again, this just gives another picture. Okay, the nasal region, nasal nose. Again, I talked to you about the ala, which are the wings. That's kind of if you can flare your nostrils. Those are the ala. The nares are the opening of the nose. The nasal septum, it's right. You can see where it's outlined, right in the center. And then the nasolabial sulcus. Think about naso, which would be nose, labial is mouth. So it's the the folds 
on either side of your mouth. Sometimes people get laugh lines there. Okay, you should know the zygomatic arch. Again, the zygomatic arch, this is where your cheeks are. The, uh, excuse me, I should say your cheekbone. And the temporomandibular joint, if you open up your mouth and if you go right by the tragus of your ear, and you can, you can feel that. You should know the, the regions of the lips, vermilion zone, the lips, vermilion border is the outside of it. The philtrum is the vertical groove between the nasal septum and your lips. And the labiocommissure, again this is an area if there's any type of lesion you'd say on the right labiocommissure or the left, it's basically the corner of the mouth. Again, you should be able to identify all of these areas. So when you think of labiomental, again, if you think of labio for lips, mental chin, labiomental groove would be the horizontal groove below the lower lip. Mental protuberance, think of something protruding. It's the prominence of your chin. So the bones of the skull, you should know that there are 22 bones which articulate or join with sutures. Sutures are made out of connective tissue. There are no sutures in the mandible or the temporal bones. There are 8 cranial bones, 14 facial bones. The bones of the skull are immovable except for the mandible and growth occurs in all the bones of the skull. So the part of the skull which houses the brain is called the, if you said cranium, you're correct. And remember that the cranial bones, there are eight. Fontanelles are basically just soft spots. Think about a baby when it's just not fully developed yet. These sutures haven't closed. So with the superior view of the skull, there are four bones visible. The frontal, the parietal bones, parietal in Latin that means walls, so those are the sides of your skull, and the occipital which is the back. I'm going to go back for a moment. So the joints between most bones are called sutures. The sutures permit a small amount of movement and provide mechanical protection for the brain by absorbing much, absorbing much of the force of a blow to the head. Okay, so the sutures, if you think about, we talked about the sagittal plane, so it makes sense that the sagittal suture is between the parietal bone. The coronal is the transverse direction between the frontal and parietal. The lambdoidal, which is an inverted V between the parietal and the occipital. And then there's the metopic. So if we think about the bregma, the bregma is the intersection between the coronal and sagittal sutures. The point of intersection between the sagittal suture and the lambdoidal suture is the lambda. The highest point of the skull is called the vertex and lies behind the bregma. The convex part of the head is the parietal eminence. Think of eminence, it's the farthest out. So here's your question. Sutures are made of what type of fibers which pass from one bone to the next? If you said connective tissue, you win. And that concludes today's lecture.